So while everyone's getting seated, um, thank you so much for Azeem and also for COGEX for having me today. Um, my name is Vivian Chan. I am the CEO and co-founder of a company called Sparrow. But I'm really pleased today to be able to share actually my own personal journey and also the vision that we're trying to build at Sparrow in terms of how we can actually go about democratizing scientific knowledge. So there's really two key things I actually want to talk about in the scope of democratization of science, which is I'll briefly touch upon in terms of search versus discovery, but also the value of looking beyond research articles, which is the current form where a lot of the cutting edge scientific research is at. Just to set the scene, there is about roughly 2% of the global GDP is actually invested in trillions in R&D. And this is increasing every single year. But actually, you can think about it, the cutting edge of scientific research at the moment are published in forms of research articles, which there's about 1.5 to 2 million pieces of scientific content published every single year, which makes it a bit of a big data problem. It's very hard to be able to actually stay on top of what's actually happening in science, um, even as a PhD student, which I was, but also, more importantly, for the wider community. So I actually stumbled upon the problem that I'm trying to solve back in my earlier days when I finished my undergrad degree um, in specializing in drug design development in Australia. And I ended up finding myself in a venture capital role. There I was looking at investing into life science projects and research spin-offs coming out from the top three of the eight universities in Australia. And there I was tasked to go about and try to find whether we should invest in the next anti-malaria therapy, therapy or is this really the next oncology uh, recommendation proposal they have in front of us. I found it particularly hard because you needed to know exactly what you're looking for, the right keywords in the search terms, in order to try to retrieve all of this later, latest cutting edge science. At the moment, all of this information are actually cased in databases, actually uh, uh, probably siloed in topics. Put a search engine on top, and off you go. You have to be able to try to find everything based on all the knowledge that you know in terms of putting in the right keywords. And if you don't find the right keywords, then you probably won't find actually what you're looking for. So that was the first um, hurdle that I had, knowing exactly all the right keywords to be able to find every little thing that I wanted um, around the cutting edge uh, discoveries of, say, arthritis. Then you were faced with a paywall issue. In the UK, a lot of the research is actually funded by taxpayers. However, if for, if for anyone to be able to access actually what's cutting edge research, you have to actually pay the publishers to, in order to actually download the papers or even access them. Um, so my, or my venture capital firm had to pay access uh, to the publishers so that I was able to look at the papers that I thought was relevant to me. And then thirdly, I was actually then staring at pages and pages of really technical content that I was just an undergraduate degree biotech um, drug design delivery person that I wasn't necessarily able to uh, understand everything that was happening in those research papers in front of me. So that was the first time I actually hit on the problem, not as a scientist, but actually as a, in venture capital. Then I moved on and actually ended up doing a PhD in X-ray crystallography at the University of Cambridge. And there I loved my research, loved my team, um, but I realized that in the, the top research uh, facilities of the world, it's really only helping you solve one of those three problems which is actually being able to access the research articles because the universities have paid for it. But finding information and understanding it doesn't necessarily help. And you still have to figure it out yourself. And so that was literally how the whole kind of vision of Sparrow came about. Um, and I think just the last point before I move on to actually show you some of the really exciting um, algorithms we've been playing around with is the fact that actually there's now a big push towards open access, given that people are waking up to the fact that taxpayers are funding for cutting-edge research. 
they actually then, uh, a lot of the funding bodies um, and the governments are now pushing for research that has been funded by taxpayers to be uh, published in open access, which means that it's going to be even more of a big data problem. So this is where we started actually asking the questions. I had the vision of democratization of science because I actually experienced it firsthand. Not necessarily, you know, um, a, you know, someone like my grandmother yet, but as an venture capital um, investor. When we started looking at actually what is the core scientific information right now, the immediate first step in our journey to democratization was that there is value in aggregation. So that was the, where the first couple of years was spent in terms of partnering with the British Library, but also building in-house technology to enable for us to have over 60 million pieces of scientific content, research papers and patents to date, and actually have technology that checks 45,000 to 50,000 journals and unique sources every single day, multiple times a day, depending on how quick the research actually is published. But then, this is great, we can actually do a lot of uh, machine learning algorithms, contextual analysis, and all that kind of uh, information in terms of extracting what potential uh, recommendations can actually happen from them. However, we then actually added an another layer on top of that, which is augmented intelligence, in terms of combining artificial intelligence that are trained by human experts from around the world, where we now have actually 420,000 monthly active users from um, 2,000 universities from around the world in 150 countries that are actually helping us train our own algorithm. We provide them with a platform to help these scientists to stay on top of research, and in return, all the activities that, that they're actually doing on platform, on Sparrow, allows us to be able to start training a very different type of recommendation engine. So this is a very rough kind of visualization of um, this animation here is just a subset of 60,000 pieces of content in our, it's a tiny proportion of our 60 million. Um, and this is a live kind of illustration of the network of all of the different research papers that we've put together. Each node of this is a, a research article. Um, and then we define all the similarities uh, based on the augmented intelligence um, actually using edges, and that can be based on language similarity, but actually more importantly trained by our human experts. And why that's important is because, especially in fields of science, humans are still better than machines at making non-linear connection points. Humans are still better to be able to go, actually, hang on a second, this mathematical equation here could be very interesting to apply into this agricultural problem here. And the pure fact of leveraging humans to be able to find those non-linear connection points and them actually pinning into, this is a content type called pin boards, and I'll explain a, a bit more about that, enables us to actually capture how humans actually think and how humans actually relate different pieces of information together. Every single time they're you know, playing around, liking, reading, exploring the different research articles, that all sends extra signals to our, our recommendation engine, but also the pinning, the act of pinning, actually is the strongest signal for us. And then on the left-hand side, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more, is actually, uh, and the video has just decided to go in a loop, um, but on the left-hand side, we're also giving people the space to actually start summarizing. These are PhDs and postdocs who are then actually summarizing why they're actually pinning on average 10 to 20 articles per pin board and what the relevance of that is. And that actually makes it pretty interesting for where we're gonna go for next. So this is just a, a, a static version of what you saw before in terms of how we actually go about transversing or rather uh, we, uh, whenever someone's looking and for looking for recommendations, um, our algorithms goes through and transverses through the network on a breadth first type approach, uh, looking based on the similarities around that, which is um, trained by augmented intelligence. And it makes it very pretty, actually. <laughs> so this is just kind of what we kind of mentioned before in terms of pinboards now 
are a visual collection of highly curated um, content, which can actually be curated, as I mentioned, by experts. But also, through our algorithms now, over time, a lot of these pinboards can also be curated by the machines themselves. Uh, and uh, that, which makes it pretty interesting for a lot of various different user personas. So this is starting to be actually formalizing the journey of where we're actually seeing how we can go about democratizing science. Yes, actually, research is very important for the researchers and those that are actually uh, doing a lot of the bench work research. But it's also very relevant. Science is also very relevant to stay on top of for other user personas, like myself when I was in, in venture capital, but also, for example, other people like sales technicians, etc. They find different types of scientific content relevant for them. And so actually, as we're starting to map out the journey to democratization, it's about creating interesting content types which allows to open up the accessibility of science to a much wider pool that collectively we can actually hopefully accelerate the pace of science a lot faster. Because actually at the, at the pace of it all, whenever you have biologists and chemists get together, that's where the field of biochemistry came about. And those pure innovations happen at the peripherals of disciplines and even sectors is where I'm actually seeing it. So just to recap, I mean, there was definitely a huge amount of value in the research articles itself. There, we're starting to actually see value in the arrogation of this, um, and also, importantly, kind of actually the search versus discovery approach in terms of, at the moment, you really still need to, as an individual, search for the key, uh, papers that you're looking for, as opposed to the algorithms that we were just showing you there. We're starting to recommend you stuff based on what you're reading. And these personalized type of recommendation is great, and it's another way of actually discovering and staying on top of information. But then we're trying to say that's great for research articles. We're now actually starting to create different types of content types, curated information, and now also summarized information. And summarized information is becoming more and more relevant to R&D organizations, but individuals, um, and I wish I had something like this when I was in, a, in VC. Being able to stay on top of actually what's happening in the field of scientists and innovation, it might not necessarily be a conclusive result, but maybe someone's actually created a new methodology or they actually realize that there is um, this, this compound ended up having an accidental effect on something else. At the moment, all of that is very bleak and it's not transparent to a lot of various different people. And even when I was actually doing my PhD, there was a lot of times where, because we had to try to publish in high impact factor journals, I had to learn a lot of biophysics techniques, even though I was trained as a biochemist. And there I was trying to sieve through and understand research papers, which was very hard, and I didn't have an expert in that field, um, but that I had to go around asking my supervisors to introduce me to other people who could then teach us. And this is where we're hoping that various different types of content types, which are actually created um, by the combination of machine learning, bus plus humans, can hopefully one day actually tackle that. So when I talk, start talking about summarized science, this is an example of it. We call it the three minute digest. It does exactly what it's meant to say in the tin. Um, that under three minutes, you're able to actually figure out what's the latest happening in the field that you're interested in. And here we actually take this by looking at all the hundreds of thousands of pin boards that are generated by our human network, and the, all of the summaries that are written on the left, we actually choose some of the best and most cutting edge ones, and then we work with the experts to create these three minute digests. And now that we've got actually thousands and thousands of these digests as well, we also have these collections of pin boards, we're also now starting to actually explore our own PhD R&D projects in-house, working with some of the universities from around the world, because we actually have training sets in terms of the core research articles in its complex form, but also expert-generated summaries, and then also editorial-type three-minute digests that we can start actually training machines to look at. So over time, what we're trying to look at 
is auto summarization algorithms specialized in science, uh, where you, by people actually clicking through it, interacting and pinning various different articles, the machines can automatically start actually giving you some sort of machine generated summary. It won't necessarily be perfect initially, but that's when we're able to get the expert community to come in and start further fine tuning um, and then giving feedback loop back to the machines. And so over time, you are then able to start actually scaling up these different types of content types in a much wider community. So this really just kind of recaps kind of what I, what, how we actually went from a big vision of democratization of science, but not really knowing as a startup, as an entrepreneur, how we were going to get there, to now getting clearer and clearer about the journey on how we actually are able to allow to create different content types using augmented intelligence that's suitable for various different user personas. Because every single person probably wants to access science, but in a different way. And science is the fundamentals of everything. The air we breathe in, the transport that we came in, and the way that our brain actually functions. But at the moment, it's not really accessible. And these are just some stats that we've been doing in terms of the linear progress and how we actually take 60 million pieces of content to uh, generate thousands and thousands of pins and different types of content types. So that actually, one day, we were hopefully, my vision on day one has never changed, where one day someone like my grandmother could understand what's actually happening in the fields of cutting edge arthritis for her own um, education, in her own language, whenever she wants. And then they're very, therefore there's a whole level of translation that we also foresee, and then there will be a whole other um, different types of not just written content, but we're also foreseeing videos, different types of content types, which could be making science a lot more accessible and then allowing for someone like Tom to go backwards, to then discover, based on translated science, there is a supporting evidence based on three-minute digest, what those research articles are, actually coming out backwards to the pin boards, and then delving back into the research papers for those that actually want to. So rather than going from the left-hand side and trying to figure it all out, we're creating various different types that, so that you can enter within the, uh, the pipeline however you want, and go backwards. And that's it. I've right on time. Um, that is kind of my story about how we can actually go about democratizing science. <laughs>